Welcome, Thesis Driven subscribers. I'm Brad Hargraves, the host of the Thesis Driven Leader series, and thanks for watching episode four. Today, we're having a conversation with an entrepreneur and real estate developer who is doing one of the craziest and most ambitious things that a real estate developer could possibly do. He's building a new city. It's been done basically not at all over the past century of American real estate. Jan Schrammack is the founder and CEO of California Forever. They're an organization that over the past seven or so years has acquired over 55,000 acres of land in California's Solano County, about 60 miles northeast of San Francisco. And there they plan to build an entirely new city that can eventually hold upwards of 400,000 people. Shramek isn't just some dreamer. He comes from a finance background and he's backed by some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley, billionaires like Mark Andreessen, the Collison brothers, and Lorene Powell Jobs. And he plans to build one of the first cities that has been made in the United States in a really, really long time. Now, when the news of what California Forever was doing was leaked in the New York Times last summer, People were scared and they were upset. It generated a lot of blowback. The idea that these shadowy Silicon Valley billionaires had slowly assembled tens of thousands of acres of farmland, ranch land, and open space, especially since it was next to a major military base, Travis Air Force Base. Earlier this year in 2024, Schrammack and California Forever finally published the details of what they want to build. And a lot of people that were skeptical last summer suddenly came around and said, hey, you know, this is kind of interesting. This is worth paying attention to. This might not be so bad. One, unlike a lot of sprawl and the way America has built many of our cities over the past 50 years, uh, California forever wanted to build density. They wanted to not use all the land they had built for building, um, but keep the development relatively concentrated in a small area. They also wanted to preserve a lot of open space, a lot of parkland. They were creating a buffer between the military base and the city. So there's a lot of things that they were able to do that I would say calm people down and got people excited about what they were doing. So if Shramak is able to be successful here, it can fundamentally change what is possible in the world of real estate, what can be accomplished, and I think open a really exciting new era of urbanism here in the United States if he can do this in the toughest place in the US, California. So today we're really excited to have that conversation with Jan Schrammack, CEO of California Forever, hear a little bit about his plans and what this means for the future. Let's dive in. Jan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Really excited to have you here. Same here, looking forward to this. So I wanna start and just take a minute and talk about your background. So I'm not sure there is any archetype for what type of person, what background starts a new city, but I'm pretty sure if there is, you're not it. So how did you get excited about the idea of starting a new city? It's a good point. I. Um... I think it was really the reaction and the contrast between the places where I lived before I moved to the Bay Area and then moving to the Bay Area. Uh, and so in the in the 10 years prior to coming here, I think I lived in York, Cambridge and London in the UK. And then I lived in Zurich and Switzerland and then spent about a year or two in New York as well. And I got here about 10 years ago um, and there was a series of shocks that I went through. Um, and the first one was, um, you have this kind of innovation ecosystem that's the that's the envy of the world and then we are completely screwing it up by our inability to build housing and i got here in 2014 and um i mean this was the time when people were throwing rocks at google buses and kim mike cutler at TechCrunch is writing about borrowing owls and the whole thing is just exploding and so seeing a place that's getting all of these high paying jobs, which in any community in the world, people would celebrate it. 
But here it was just ripping communities apart because you had this duality of, well, we're going to get the jobs, but housing prices are going to go up because we basically created a zero sum tournament of everyone fighting over a fixed housing stock. So that was one shock. And then I think the second one was I, um, I just missed walkable neighborhoods. I mean, we do have some of them in the Bay Area, uh, but they really are in San Francisco and Berkeley. That's kind of it, maybe a little bit in Oakland. Um, and because we had so few of them, um, the cost of it was astronomical. And I mean, I was paid relatively well. My, my, my girlfriend at the time was as well. And we were still struggling to afford to live in one of these walkable neighborhoods. Um, and so those two things put together, um, I just got interested initially just looking at housing and what you could do here. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I mean, the contrast was really, it was really, uh, um, stuck to me where we had to move to live on the peninsula, um, a couple of years in my, my girlfriend worked there. Um, and uh, I mean, the contrast for me was in the 10 years prior to coming to the Bay area, I did not, I didn't drive the car once. I don't mean I didn't right. own it. I don't mean I didn't like rent it. I mean, like I did not drive it once. Uh, and in Zurich, I don't think in the three years of living there, I don't think I got into a car once. I never was in a taxi. I was never in an Uber. Uh, and so that contrast was just um, stark. Yeah. So bringing the model of walkable cities, I mean, one thing I want to talk about is the design here. Um, you know, I looked at it, I looked at the plans back in August and it, it struck me as, you know, this is a new urbanist community. Uh, but when you described it on the website, you said, you know, let's go back to, you know, it's not necessarily new urbanist. It's really directly inspired by 19th century urban design. So d explain that distinction a little bit more to me so I understand it. I mean, I think that the, the... 80% of it is the same. So 80%, I think it's it's 80% new urbanist. I think there are two two profound distinctions between what we're trying to do. And I would say one is to do with the question of scale. And then the other one is to do with how far do you go? And so when I look at all of the new urbanist communities, um, the things that have actually been built tend to be smaller. Uh, and many of them yes. are substantial, but we're still talking thousands, maybe 10, maybe 20,000 people. Um, the plan that we've put forward um, and we're putting on the ballot is for a city of up to 400,000 people that's on the order of 17,500 acres. And so maybe two thirds the size of San Francisco. Um, and the majority of this would be built out. We're not talking about 80% of it is parks, maybe 20% of it is park. And so most of it is built out. And at that scale, um, we get confronted by issues that the new urbanist um, developments haven't really confronted. If you look at some of the best ones, there are places that you drive to and then you walk in and you move around walking in or maybe they have a tram, but they didn't have to confront the genuine questions of movement and, and within the city. And so, for example, sorry, go on. No, I, I was going to say, well, I want to come back to transportation, but continue. Um, so that's one. And then the second one, I think, is that in, in some sense, we want to be a bit more radical and go further than the some of the new, new urbanist communities. And I think... I think when I look at the designs for some of them, it feels like the original vision of the people who are building them got watered down a little bit through regulations, which I understand. It's, it's so, as, as you know, it's so hard to override the years and years of kind of suburban planning. And when I look at all of these um, plans or places that I visited, I often wonder, was the original vision somehow more radical? And then it got watered down because the fire department said something and the, the city has said something. And so because we're operating at such a large scale, we want to see whether we can stay closer to the true urban vision instead of building something a little bit in between. I love it. Um, so I, I do want to talk about, you know, you mentioned California and kind of your experience in the Bay Area mm -hmm. driving you to this idea of to create not just a new city, but a new city that is you know, fundamentally more walkable, you don't need a car. We'll get to that in a bit. But it feels like if you want to do this and you want to accomplish like, okay, let's create a truly walkable community. You know, why do this in California of all places? Wouldn't it be easier to find some 
distressed town in West Virginia or rural Pennsylvania and say, hey, we are going to bring every fab, every second headquarters of every Silicon Valley company here, and they'll upzone you to the moon. Why California? Um, because people want to live here. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really good question. I, so my, my, my path to, work, to, to working on this was, I mentioned I was kind of dismayed with the state of, with the, with the status quo in the Bay. And so I spent about a year looking at infill ideas in the existing Bay Area. And then even when I decided to work on starting from scratch, I, I thought of and actually pursued and explored two different models. And one was this city in this location here in Solano County. And the other, for the reasons that you described, the regulation, the difficulty of building, was to actually build, um, build something in a, in, a, in a place that is much less regulated, likely in the Southwest or in the Southeast. Um, and I think they are both viable models. And I, I, I like that people are working on the other ones. Um, ultimately, I was personally more interested in trying to do it in California, even if that meant putting up with all of the difficulty of building here. But I think I think that you can choose one of two challenges. You kind of either build in a place where entitlements are really hard, but provided that you can do that, demand is going to be easier, or you go to a place where it's easy to build, and then you'll be creating the demand and, and working on the demand. And we chose the former. But I, I, I do think they are both viable approaches, and I, I hope we see many people trying the other one as well. Yeah, I certainly see people going in both directions. I mean... Uh, you know, I know of one building outside of Austin, tackling the problem of, okay, great, people, it, it's easier to get entitlements out there, but how do you get people to go 30 miles outside of Austin? Yep. You know, I see people as well looking in the Hudson Valley. There, it's like, okay, fine, people may want to go there, but can you get industry to go there? Can you get jobs? I want to come back to that in a minute because a lot of the new urbanist communities that have been created you know, we profiled what Casey Roloff did in Seabrook. Beautiful town. It's a vacation town. You know, he's not bringing new fabricators there. Um, so I, I do want to get that to that in a minute. But before we do, I want to address one of the biggest objections that people make to this entire concept. Michael Eliason runs Larch Lab. Urbanist I very much respect. Called you a climate arsonist for building a new community as opposed to doing infill. And I see a lot of people flippantly say, hey, this is just more sprawl. We've been doing sprawl for a while. How would you respond to that? I understand where people come from on the first reaction, because in, in particularly in America, for the last 40 years, Greenfield has generally e equal sprawl. But I think when you actually look at the plans and you actually think through what's going on, the reality is completely the opposite. And so... Um, we, we do need infill. The majority of the solution to the housing crisis is going to be infill. As I mentioned, I spent a year working on it. But the reason for why I ended up working on this is that um, my conclusion seven years ago was that, especially in California, infill just would not be enough. There was just no way the numbers were going to add up. And um, I mean, the, the, the governor has said when he ran that we are missing two and a half million homes and few people dispute that number. We are building 100,000 homes a year, roughly. And even in the last, I've been working on this for almost eight years at this point. And in those eight years, the numbers have kind of come up a little bit, but not by much. Even if those numbers come up by 50% and we build 50,000 homes more every year, it's going to take 50 years to build two and a half million extra homes because the 100,000 that we're building every year, that's just keeping up with the natural growth of demand. And so there's just no numerical way that that can end up without a big solution. And I think to people who look at the climate perspective, they need to look at the alternative. The alternative is not that these people move to downtown San Francisco because they won't. The housing isn't getting built. The people who are leaving California because we are not building what we are proposing to build are moving to an exurb outside of Phoenix or Houston, buying a 5,000 square foot mansion and buying a big pickup truck and running AC 24 seven. And so I think if you look particularly at people on the environmental side who care about climate, us building a dense walkable community in a place that has climate that naturally has very minimal footprint is 
by far more sustainable than pushing those people to move to Phoenix or Houston or Dallas or Orlando or any of those places where their carbon footprint will be way higher. Right. I think one common mistake a lot of people make when they're thinking through these is the people don't go away. The people are still there. You're not you know, evaporating the people. They're just going somewhere else. And there are limited places they can go. And you know, as, as it turns out, the place we are building is in Frisco, Texas, is outside of Phoenix. And sadly, that's, uh, those are the areas that are growing right now. Um, and you know, I don't think that's any better. But um, one key part of climate emissions, et cetera, is transportation. I would love for you to talk a little bit about the transportation strategy here. When I first saw you know, the map, uh, this is back in August before you released the more detailed plans, I kind of assumed you would put this on the river and, I don't know, run some sort of ferry system. I don't know. Um, but it's, 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 it's on the other side. It's, near, uh, it's, it's, it's close to the Air Force Base. So tell me a little bit about how you plan moving people, you know, people coming and going as well as people moving within the community itself. What is the community going to be called, by the way? I, I, I've still been calling it California Forever, which seems like an awkward name for a town. Uh, that's the name of the company. The, the name of the community we'll figure out in the future. So okay. um, we're open to ideas if you have any, but we haven't, we haven't named it yet. Um, the transportation plan. So two parts to it, the internal transportation and then the external transportation. So let's start with the internal transportation. So we, we're pretty confident that internally within the new community, we will have the lowest BMT of any city in California. And the, possibly- BMT for the audience is vehicle miles traveled. Exactly right. How many people basically get around using a car, um, whether they are driving their own car or even Uber or car share or anything like that. Um, and um, we believe that because of how we've designed it. And so we expect most people will get around on foot. They will get around on bikes. We have most of our streets have dedicated bike lanes, protected bike lanes. And using um, transit, we have dedicated BRT type lanes that we might over time upgrade into trams um, or that could have smaller shuttles in them running through most of the um, major streets. Um, we specifically designed the neighborhoods and many of the streets to permit in particular kids to walk to school alone. And so we have many streets that are modeled on the um, Dutch Wunerfs, uh, kind of short streets, five, 10 miles an hour speed limits. We have greenways. Um, and then the way that we approach the entire design is we started with how, what's the kind of density that you need to support a local shopping street that has enough people living close to it that the retailers actually survive. Um, and so one of our design standards is that every home, every single home in the new community has to be within a 10 minute walk of a school, a local shopping street and a transit line. Hmm. And then we have a grid um, um, with transit. And th- that means that you can get anywhere in the new city with one stop. Um, so that's the internal piece of it. And we're very confident that we'll have a very low footprint there. Um, externally, there's, um, um, there's, there's kind of two ways to think about this. So first of all, our jobs plan is, our, is the bulk of our transportation plan. And so we'll, we'll get to talk about employers later, but the core assumption here is um, bring a very serious number of um, employers across different types of jobs, different types of pay scales, so that as many people as possible who live in this community can work there. And even people who live in neighboring communities can commute into this. And I'm happy to talk about why we believe we can do that. Um, but the last thing I'll say is there's two ways to think about this new community. You can either say it's five miles away or seven miles away from Fairfield, and therefore that it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. Or you can take a more global view and you can say, if you look at the entire Northern California mega region, the whole area from San Jose to Sacramento and increasingly all the way to Tahoe, which through COVID has really become a, a singular region. It's no longer the Bay Area. I mean, you have people who live in Sacramento and they come to the Bay twice a week. Um, this side is bang in the middle. And so you can say it's in the middle of nowhere if you say very locally, or you can say it's in the middle there. Um, and if you look at the transportation pattern in the whole Bay Area, um, it's basically people from 
Solano County, Stockton, Lodi, Sacramento, coming down to San Francisco, to Palo Alto, to Walnut Creek, to Pleasanton. Um, and so if we can pull it off and if we can do our job right and bring a lot of jobs there, we believe we can actually, even if you put aside the trains, which I will get to in a second, even if people continue to drive, we can reduce VMT because everyone who's in Solano County and people who are in Stockton and Manteca and Lodi and Tracy will have a shorter commute. Instead of spending two hours, they'll be able to commute 30 minutes. Um, so that's, that's the core of it. Um, in addition to that, we would want to um, um, do more on rail. Capital Corridor is about four miles, seven miles from the site, depending on how you measure it. Uh, there is an old rail spur that goes through the site um, <laughs> that we are looking into possibly rebuilding. Um, but with regards to kind of public transportation, a lot of this really depends on um, what happens with that in the Bay Area. I mean, as a region, we have this kind of big decision of are we actually going to start building instead of just talking about building and there's been a lot of excitement about the transit in the bay but there's a lo long way to go right i mean even compared to new york we have all of these different agencies and i think there's 27 different transit agencies right now in the bay um and so we do hope that we start doing a lot more as a region and given our central location there we, we think we could get a pretty meaningful part to play in that but it's not something that we control just ourselves. Do you have any estimates just of how many, what percentage of your residents do you think will own cars? Um, we would guess maybe 25%. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That would be an, an incredible achievement. I mean, Manhattan is 25%. Yep. That's, that's what we know. I mean, I think that's, I, I, I will qualify that by saying that is probably in the later stages of the community when there's right. kind of more there in the beginning, people will have, will have less than that. But the one thing that we are very focused on is that we would want to have very few families. We would want to create a place where it's possible for most families to have at most one car. Got it. Uh, and so that in a, in, in, in the context of kind of Northern California would already be a big achievement. Um, and happy to talk about how we're thinking about private car ownership and garages and parking. If, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I want to get to that, but I do want to talk about jobs. I mean, obviously, jobs and transportation are incredibly linked. Uh, once again, when I first heard about this, I thought, okay, there's there's going to be a sizable percentage of people commuting into San Francisco every day, maybe even commuting into South Bay every day. Uh, doesn't sound like that's in your plan. So what's the what's the plan to bring bring jobs here? I mean, I think it's to... Let's take a step back and... I think let's look through the evolution of what Bay Area employers have gone through over the last few years. And so I think you go back to 2017, 2018, you have the frustration with the Bay Area and why it's not building enough. And people are, I don't want to say, people are exploring or building offices elsewhere, right? And so they're putting sales teams in Phoenix and they're putting engineers in Austin or in Denver or Boise. And then COVID hits and, uh, First, we don't know what to do, and then everyone is going to be remote, and then everyone is going to go to Miami and Austin. And then kind of I, what we're hearing is most companies have gone through kind of a through of disillusionment and challenges where they realize, well, those areas have gotten a lot more expensive. They have challenges of their own. It's really hard to run remote teams. Uh, it's, it, might be a, it might be a two and a half hour flight to go to Austin but you still need to spend a day doing it, right? Because it's right. car or Uber and park it and TSA and flight is delayed and then you get on a flight and then Uber and then you get to the office. And so what we hear right now is um, there's a lot of employers in the Bay who um, they want to have employees in the office either all the time or for three or four days a week, um, but they're struggling to get people in the office um, because, and when you ask them why, it's because their employees don't want to spend an hour commuting. And right now they are spread all over the Bay Area. Um, and then you hear the frustration with, we don't want, Austin is great, but it's not the saving grade because we can't have people frequently get together with the people in the headquarter. And so um, the reason for why we're optimistic about bringing jobs here is if you, let's split companies into two buckets. I think the first one is kind of big tech companies, software companies, and for them, the value prop is um, 
we're building a walkable community where everyone will live within five, 10, 15 minutes of the office. And so your people will be on the office every day because most people who live within 15 minutes of the office will come in every day. Most people like the office. They hate the commute, particularly if you can build the office to not be a stadium where 400 people sit in an open plan, but instead you build small offices, right? And if we're building all of the offices from scratch, guess what? We can design it right. And so the pitch is it's a cheaper location. Your employees will be able to buy homes. Many of them, by the way, already live in Solano County and commute. Um, you'll be able to have them in the office every day. And on top of that, when they are to have a meeting with someone who works in Menlo Park or Cupertino or San Francisco, you can get there in a car. And if you take an Uber or something like that, your employees can work. Um, and so it's a, it's a much better option than a place like Austin or Phoenix or something like that. So that's for the bigger companies. And then the other part of it is there's been this real renaissance in the Valley in wanting to do stuff in the physical world, advanced manufacturing, biotech, defense, drones, agricultural technology. And, um, so much of that is being created and funded in Silicon Valley, but you can't actually get lab space. You can't actually get manufacturing space in the Valley. Uh, and we have a big air force base here. We have a lot of, um, defense experience. We have a lot of kind of cultural affinity for that, for that industry. Uh, there's a lot of people here who, um, still have skills in, um, kind of skilled labor. Um, and so even for smaller companies, that's the other one that we're excited about is bring all of the advanced manufacturing, biotech, different startups here, build the lab space, build the manufacturing space. Um, and in some sense, go back to what Silicon Valley used to do 50 years ago. I love it. So I want to pivot for a second and talk about your investors. Um, you have a very impressive list of investors, you know, who's who of, 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 of Silicon Valley. Um, what was the process of raising money for this? I mean, walking up to Lorraine Pal Jobs, Mark Andreessen and saying, I'd like to start a new city in Solano County. I mean, how, how, how did that go down? Uh, it was difficult. I, um, I mean, it was difficult because there's no precedence for this, right? And so right. when you're coming to people and you're starting a software company, there's comms and they know how to look at it and they know how to evaluate it. And here it was a, nobody quite knew how to look at it. I think, and in the beginning, by the way, nobody wanted to invest. And so in the beginning, I had to, nobody would invest in the beginning. And so I had to borrow a lot of money personally and just underwrite it personally. Um, take way too much personal risk and just started with debt. And eventually we were able to convert it into equity. But I think ultimately what won people over is um, I just did the work. And I kind of, I, I don't want to, I mean, if I were to overstate the case, I think to some extent we just, or well, I just wore people down in that they would have 150 guesses as to why this wouldn't work. And we just had the answers. And if we didn't have them, we went and got the answers. So it was, why is it going to work politically? And is there some issue with the soil? And where is the water going to come from? And how are you going to build the alliances locally to get it approved? And how does the airspace work? And what about rare species? And how are we going to build a train line eventually? And why would anyone live in a walkable community? How can you prove that people will live in a walkable community? And this is a short list, but there's 150 reasons you can come up with why this wouldn't work. And we couldn't guarantee that they wouldn't work, but um, that they we would be able to overcome them. Well, for some of them we could, um, but we just did the work and we had the answers. And um, over time, um, we were able to convince people of that. I think that was it was really um, the benefit of building a city if you have the right vision and the location, as opposed to a software company, is that you can get a lot of the answers. What you can't do is. You can't, you can't run a performer on it like you run on a building right. because there's too many unknowns, but you can show that all the reasons for why it wouldn't work, there was a good chance that it could work. And so we, I think we just did the work. So tell me a little bit about the sequencing here. I mean, did you know when you started approaching investors, we are going to have it here, this location in Solano County? Yes. So the way that this came around is I, I was looking at doing infill. And then this was in 2016, 2017. And then sometime in 2017, I just decided I didn't, 
think that I could add anything meaningful in infill. People were going to do it, but my contribution compared to the marginal developer was limited. I had some ideas for how to improve it, but it was marginal. Um, and then I had a thought of, well, what if you could start from scratch somewhere at the, at the edge of the Bay Area? And I essentially instantly thought about this site because four or five months before then, um, my girlfriend and I went fishing in Rio Vista on the Delta and we drove through the site and I remembered look, driving through this expanse of land and I remember it wasn't, it wasn't orchards and it wasn't vineyards and it wasn't row crops and it was this big site. And so the, the, the immediate hunch was that this site could be it. Uh, and then I started studying this site and spent probably half a year studying this site and kind of gave up on the idea a bunch of times because it just seemed too crazy, honestly. Um, but I just couldn't find a reason for why it wouldn't work. Um, and um, as part of the process, eventually I did run the screen and looked everywhere else in the Bay. So, um, and I looked and kind of in the broader region and I looked at all of the factors that would matter for this. And it, it happened to be the case that this site was by far the most important, the best site that, that, that existed. And importantly, the reason why I was so excited about this site is that, um, and why I actually thought it might work is I remembered having this conversation with the fishing guide on the river when we were there in the beginning. And um, um, one of the trips when I went there, someone told me that their wife commuted to Palo Alto. Hmm. And I was like, you have young kids, how does that work? And he goes, she gets up at 3 a.m. in the morning to get there before traffic. Oh. So she can leave at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and get home before the kids get home. And I was like, that's insane. And it was like, you wouldn't believe how many of my friends do the same thing. And so that's mm -hmm. what I thought, well, maybe there's something that we could bring to the county that would actually make people want to have this here. It would be different than other parts of the Bay. Um, and so eventually around the screen and this site came on top. And so when I was approaching investors, it was always for this site. Um, but as I mentioned in the beginning, we, we didn't quite have the external validation of third party studies about the legal land use and the politics and so on. And so initially financed it with debt. And then eventually, um, once we got more third party studies done, people came in with equity. That's great. So I want to stay on your investors for a second. Mm -hmm. What are their goals in this? How much of it is they want to make money that there's a financial incentive versus many of them are in the Bay Area, a belief that this needs to exist? Um, I mean, we've never shied away from the fact that it's a for-profit investment. And so for all of them, this is a for-profit investment. Um, some of the investors we have are um, our funds. Uh, and so for them, they, they have to look at it purely as a for-profit <laughs> investment. Um, I do think that for many of them, in particular, many of the individuals, it's for-profit and something. And what the something is, is different for some of them, right? I mean, we yeah. have people who really care about the sustainability angle. We have investors who really care about the economic opportunity angle. We have investors who really care about urbanism. Um, we have investors who really care about California kind of getting back to what it used to be and building big, great things and showing the country what can happen. Um, but it's, it's definitely a for-profit investment. And then there's components to it that go over and beyond that, that are kind of a, a, a bonus and a thing that people push us on when it comes to the planning and that they want to see in the plans. So just staying on the for-profit angle, you know, many of our listeners are in real estate. They're developers, they're investors, both retail and institutional. How does one make money from starting a new city? Um, you put a lot of money into the ground, into buying the land, then you put in a lot more money into infrastructure, then you probably sell some homes in the beginning, um, at little profit or possibly at a loss, you subsidize the early retail and the schools, and hopefully eventually you start breaking even. And then over time you start making money as you sell or lease property. And so it is a very, very, very long-term investment that does require a lot of capital. But generally, you expect your returns tend to be very backloaded. Yes. Um, and um, and um, and so much of this is, is is structuring the capital stack correctly and with long term patient capital, uh, and then being very diligent about how it's financed throughout, so you can get to to the end of that. But um, I mean, these large large scale projects have been done in in the country yeah. before. Um, 
the woodlands in Texas is a good example. Summerlin in Vegas is a good example. Um, Reston uh, and Columbia on the East Coast and Irvine Company here in California, all good examples. Um, some of them have gone better than others financially, um, but they are all good examples. I would say I want to draw a clear distinction in that most of them are suburban communities in nature. Um, they've right. been adding more walkability over time. We're trying to do something different in terms of the product type, but the business model is is fairly similar. So are, are, is the majority of this going to be for sale and how, or how are you splitting for sale versus for rent product? Um, well, I mean, a lot of it will be dictated by the market. I would expect yeah. that we have a pretty um, similar balance of for sale and for rent as other um, kind of walkable, livable communities in the country. So if I had to guess, I would guess it's 50-50. Uh, but it really depends. And it will it will likely change over time. It's probably going to be a little bit more for sale in the beginning, a little bit more for rent towards the end. But, so, um, so what is your current investors and your maybe you know time horizon for that return? I mean, is this, okay, we're going in and seven years later... We're going to get refied out. Blackstone's going to come in and buy this. Like we're going to get cashed out versus, hey, this is an investment our children can inherit. It's more the latter. I mean, we 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 don't think of it. We think of it as a company more than a real estate investment project that kind of is a separate <laughs> life. And so, um, I we don't expect to be kind of pulling money out or having dividends for decades. Likely, this would be continuous reinvestment. And then the return comes in the form of capital appreciation of the project as a whole. Um, and um, I do know that for, for the investors, the, the hope is to hold this for a really long time. Um, and one of the ways that I thought of who we would want to have as investors was to find people and institutions that would want to hold this for a really long time. So I could ask a lot of questions. We could talk all day long about structuring and the capital stack and all of that. Um, I do want to make sure we hit a few few other topics. So one I definitely wanted to hit was to talk about the announcement last August. I don't know how intentional that announcement was, but uh, do you see, and obviously it generated a lot of blowback. Um, you know, I wrote a newsletter for Thesis Driven that I, I, I viewed as being very, very balanced, but it was probably one of the more positive uh, on a spectrum <laughs> articles about uh, uh, about California forever and what y'all were doing. Do you think that that blowback was inevitable or are there things you look back to and say, ah, we should have done this differently? No, it was, it was totally inevitable. I, I think it was largely inevitable. I mean, on the margin, did I wish that we'd done a couple of things differently? The only, I mean, the main one, so we wanted to announce the project in September um, and then in preparation for that, we started hiring people and doing polling and all of the other things. And that's what led to um, uh, the team at New York Times finding out about it. Uh, and that basically brought forward the announcement, if you want, for, in the form of the um, article in the Times by about two weeks. And so we would have announced it otherwise two weeks later. Um, but I don't think that that made so much of a difference. Um, our take on this was... Um, the landing was always going to be super controversial. I mean, you have a secret entity. Um, you have an entity that nobody knows who, what they're doing, buying land on the quiet um, for seven years in the Bay Area next to a military base. Um, and that was just. And then we knew that when it came out, we would have to, we would want to talk about who's funding it. And the reason why they bought it is to build a new city, and it's funded by leading investors in Silicon Valley. I mean, there was just no way that it was going to be a, not a controversial landing and everyone was going to write the headlines they were going to write. Um, and so our take on this was, it was really important for us to be able to acquire the property that we needed. And in particular to acquire a really large holding in that area, which would give us the flexibility to cite things depending on community feedback. And so we knew that we could design something here that would work for all of the stakeholders if we had enough flexibility and if we controlled the land. And so we took the view of, we're going to do that. We're going to announce it. It's going to be controversial. People are going to have doubts. All the headlines are going to get written, but we're going to get in the community and we're going to communicate why we did it. And we're going to tell our story and we're going to say, here is why we didn't talk about it. Um, here's how land, land assembly works. This is why you don't talk about it. 
but we're here and we want your input. And our view was that over time, we would be able to build trust. Um, and I think that's begun to happen. Uh, I, actually, I think that's happened quicker than we expected in some sense. And um, there was a little skepticism over the last five months as we were doing this listening tour and designing the plan. But if you look at the responses to the plan that have come out since then, um, they've been really, really positive. And I think that's the case both locally. We now have hundreds of local supporters who we have uh, support in statements and endorsements on our website. And, and it's been similar in the Yimbi community. I think a lot of the people had doubts in, um, in September when we announced the project, right? If you looked on kind of Yimbi Twitter, a lot of people are like, ah, I don't know whether this is greenwashed suburbia or is it real urbanism? Are these guys really going to do it? And then we put out the plans in whatever, three weeks ago. Um, and the conversation has been, I would say, 90% positive. And it's been yeah. a lot of people saying, you know, I had doubts, but I look at this plan and it's got everything in it that Yimbis have been calling for in the country for 20 years. It's got a form-based code. It's got a minimum density. It's got transit. It's got parking at the edge. Um, it's got all of these commitments about jobs. And so that's that's been the plan. And I think so far it's working. I love it. And, and, and I will agree with that, that the tenor of the conversation has been fundamentally different this time around versus in August when the initial announcement came out. It's been, I think, people being able to dig into the details, understand what your plans are, uh, understand that the worst of their fear, fears are probably not going to be realized is uh, has 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 been a really good thing, and the and the and the tenor has been has been fundamentally different. But I want to talk about okay, it is uh, as of this recording, we are in February. Um, you have what is it nine months before this ballot initiative? What is your plan over the next nine months to get? A majority and win this ballot initiative um it's really to communicate the it's it's to communicate the commitments in the initiative that's really the core of it um and so we started by we we, we seriously seriously listened to the community for the last five months i mean i did hundreds of meetings people would email us say i want to have coffee and we wouldn't have some junior staff go and meet with them i would go and meet with people and i would i would listen and so we, de we designed the initiative to be something that we knew people would support and they could come out in favor of. And that is the location of it. It's the sizing of it. It is um, the guarantees that we have in the initiative. And so we have a guarantee that we can only go to a certain size unless we've created 15,000 jobs that pay 125% of the county average. We have a big down payment assistance program. We have a big commitment to also invest in existing downtowns in Solano County. Um, and so what that's done is um, it's allowed a lot of people who like the idea in the community to come out and say, I support this. Yeah. Um, and so now it's really um, communicating that and, and, and that includes um, community events and social media and paid advertising and um, really giving the tools to the people here who want to see this in the county, and there's so many of them, uh, the tools and the information they need to go to talk to the people who are open-minded about it and say, here are all of the good things about it. And I know that you are worried about Travis and water and transportation, and here is what the company is doing about it. And so I, I think that the reason for why I spent seven years of my life working on this before we went public is we did the work and I felt pretty confident that this was a genuine case of kind of non-zero sum grow the pie. This project in this location makes sense. Um, the negative effects are limited and we can mitigate so many of them. And then the win for the community in terms of uh, houses people can buy and afford in terms of jobs, in terms of clean energy are so substantial that if we can just get the time explain it to people, get local supporters and get them to tell their friends and get them to tell their colleagues at work, uh, we'll get there. And that's what we've consistently seen in the data. I mean, from the day we announced, we had way more people who were in favor of this than people who were against it. Um, and then there was this huge number of people who said, I like some of what I'm hearing. I have concerns. I don't know. I need to see the plan. 
and then and then since we put out the plan people have been gradually moving from the i don't know to the i support it i i had doubts but i have these guarantees and i have um i have these guarantees about the mitigating the transportation and water and travis challenges and i see the plan and i like it and so it's just moving people through that whole process and just so we so we're clear with the audience when you say travis you mean travis air force base which is yes. A, I mean, maybe just describe a little bit of the dynamic there. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting dynamic. So Travis Air Force Base is um, the largest um, air mobility command on the West Coast, and so it's a it's a it's a cargo air force base, cargo and refueling, um, and it's really important for our national security on the West Coast, particularly given what's going on with China right now. Um, and there is a there is a very interesting relationship where we the, the count it's the largest employer in the county um it is culturally very important um and it's obviously very important for national security and so people want to make sure that whatever we build is not going to infringe on the mission because of where we put things in the flight paths or we don't want to create people complaining about noise and all of the things that come with being next to a military base at the same time um there is a wide recognition in the community that um, there are things that our project could do for the base that would be really good. Um, one of the big challenges for Travis is that housing affordability and the quality of the homes that someone who works on the base can afford right now is limited. And so what we've heard is one of the difficulties in the military in general is retaining the families. Um, and imagine you have someone who is living in Texas and then they get reallocated to Travis Air Force Base. The shock in terms of the cost of living is enormous. Um, in addition, you have challenges like I talked about how few good paying jobs are here in Solano County right now. Uh, people who work on the base have spouses. The spouses need work. If your spouse works, if your spouse is a pilot who flies planes, it really sucks if you have to travel two hours every day to work and you have small kids. And so the value of local good paying jobs is really high. Uh, and then there are shared goals like clean energy. I mean, we are proposing to build what would be probably the largest solar farm in the state of California. Wow. Uh, and the DOD has very aggressive renewable energy targets. And right now, um, um, there's an opportunity to get clean power to Travis, backup source of power to Travis, and so on. And so there's this relationship where we have to do a good job of protecting the base. But as long as we do that, there's all of these other things that we can deliver to the base that would really set it up tremendously for the next 50 years. And that's what we're hoping to do. So just thinking about the politics of this election, it's a presidential election year. Do you think that works in your favor? It's going to be high turnout. Generally, yes. I mean, generally, as you know, one of the, if you look at um, the people who are basically universally in favor of this are young people, because they, they feel the, the, they feel the, they feel like the California dream got taken away from them, right? Uh, they, they look at the old generations and they say, you bought a house for $50,000 or $100,000 and you went to college for free or you paid nothing and you had no student debt. And I left college with massive student debt and there's no way I can buy a home. And so young people in, in, in general are really in favor of this. Um, and, and that helps in that some, the reason why some of the older people are in favor of it is they say, I don't want to live in your community. I like living in Fairfield or Vacaville, but I want my kids to live there because I don't want them to move to Austin and then I never see my grandkids. Um, and so presidential election, probably good for us. So last question before we move into the lightning round. Uh, let's look forward for a minute. Let's say we win the no November ballot initiative. What happens next? When can I move in? Um, Hopefully in 2027, that's aggressive, but, uh, but especially by California standards. Um, but we do think it's possible. Um, big picture, after the election, we need to negotiate and sign a development agreement with the county, which is an express condition in the initiative that would kind of further break down in more detail some of the commitments we've made, as well as other things. And then in connection with that, we would go through the um, CEQA process and an environmental, California Environmental Quality Act and the Environmental Impact Report process. Did, did, wouldn't the popular vote supersede CEQA? Um, 
it would, but because we are going to enter into a development agreement and because we wanted to give the voters the comfort that we are not bypassing CEQA, um, we actually made the um, development conditional on going through a full EIR. Um, wow. Sometimes sometimes developers have used uh, initiatives to get around CEQA, um, and we really felt that we wanted people to know that we believe this is a good project environmentally and it will come through. And so we're going to go through CEQA. Um, and then to your point about moving in, um, how that goes and how long it takes uh, will be one of the big determinants of um, when is it that people can move in. Uh, but in terms of moving in, um, there is um, there are power lines at the site. We have water rights, uh, so we would need to build the infrastructure, but all of the components of what we need are there. And so I think from when we can break ground, it's, uh, it's a year or two and uh, the first people can move in. And are you going to develop this yourselves, create your own development company? Or are you going to bring in a JV partner there? How are you thinking about that? Um, we'll be the master developer. We will be building definitely um, big chunks of this. And then we'll be, we'll be bringing in other partners to build components of this. Um, the, the, the thing that we are most excited about is we really want to find a way to create a platform for, in particular, smaller home builders to build on. Um, one of the one of the things that I, I I've been obsessed about since the beginning is how do you get the true diversity of the urban fabric? How does it not feel like a subdivision? How does it not feel like this was done by kind of a master developer and it's got this like eerie feeling to it? it it's the houses are a little bit different, but it looks like fake diversity. And so we think the way to do that is um, to make it possible again for smaller builders to build in smaller numbers of lots, to build one house or to build four houses and then go do it again somewhere in the neighborhood. And our general take on this is that um, the reason for why that's not possible or it's harder today is that because of over-regulation and because of financing constraints, it's become really hard to be a small builder. But if we get this project approved, then we have the land, we have the approvals uh, on it to build, we can potentially help with financing. And so we can, and we have a predictable supply of sites to build on for the next 20 years. And so hope, we hope we can uh, work with some of the local home builders and help other people start companies or bring companies here and have lots and lots and lots of smaller builders building. So we get much more of an organic feel and fabric to the neighborhood. And maybe some some of them can live there too. Oh, absolutely! I hope so. I mean, we've we've people have asked us who do you hope will be the um, early residents, and my favorite answer is I hope that people building the community are some of the first yeah. people there because I think well I'll, I'll be moving in the first house, but other than that, um, I genuinely think there's something you get a different community if the people who build it live there. Like if 100%. you think about. If you're a construction worker and you're building the school and you know that your kids or your grandkids are going to move to the school or you're designing it or you're doing the landscaping there, like you'll just care on a different level. And I think that there's a um, there's an esprit de corps, this kind of sense of community. Like imagine how awesome it would be if all of the people who move there were building it and you get the yeah. sense of like you're building it for yourself and for your family and for your kids. It would just be an amazing example of American dynamism and us building big stuff again. I love it. Um, let's move to the lightning round. Uh, so here, quick questions, quick answers, uh, not necessarily about what you're doing, but more broadly oriented. So first question, uh, give us, you, for a new developer starting out, what's one piece of advice you would give them? You should ask me in 10 years. I, I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer this one. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm new in the business. Um, I think, I mean, I, I think the macro observation is particularly if you're doing something really ambitious, you really have to care about the problem because as you know, the number of difficulties and no's that you're going to encounter in the problem in the process is just astonishing. So there's a lot of other easier ways to make money. So you better care about the problem. Absolutely. Uh, tell us about one startup, one developer, one entrepreneur you're watching closely and why. Um, I think what Alexis Rivas at Cover is doing mm. is pretty interesting. Uh, and so they are a LA-based startup um, working on modular housing. 
Cool. And there have been a lot of people who've tried that. And in general, it's a bit of a graveyard. Um, but I think they've taken a lot of lessons from Tesla um, and they're approaching it. I like the kit of parts approach they have to the problem rather than building volumetric modular and shipping boxes around, which I think is limited applicability. Um, and they've started with ADUs in LA. And I think that the product looks beautiful. And so uh, I'm excited to see what I can do. Yeah, I've been, it's been fun to watch some of the, a lot of the ADU innovation happening in uh, California and LA in particular. It's, uh, it's a lot of it happening. Uh, what, so we're recording this podcast in the 2030s. What is the number one thing we're talking about and why? I think it's self-driving cars. And I know people have been talking about it for a long time and it got overhyped a bunch of times. Um, but I think it's probably that. And I fear that it's not going to be, unless we really do a good job of adapting the built environment to it, it might be more bad than good in a lot of senses. And so I think self-driving cars on highways, really good. Self-driving cars in cities, TBD and will need to be priced correctly otherwise we'll just end up with endless traffic jam i i wrote about this a uh, few months ago in thesis driven because i feel like there have been so many false starts with autonomous vehicles that now everyone kind of ignores it exactly. but it's actually happening now and i feel like it's going to sneak up on a lot of people particularly a lot of people in real estate because the media has cried wolf so many times and we've always thought it was happening, when it actually happens, I think it's going to shock a lot of people. 100%. I couldn't agree more. I think that's exactly what's happened. People have discarded it because they've heard about it five years ago, and now they're not watching the fact that it's, it's now finally happening. Yeah. Um, if you could change one local, national, any level, real estate law or policy with a snap of your fingers, what would it be? I don't know much about this program, but I heard um, Kobe Lefkowitz uh, told me about a program that exists in Canada that I thought was great, which is apparently the Canadian government provides low cost of financing to developers at a highly subsidized rate and with mm -hmm. a high um, uh, with a high loan to value ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think of all of the things that the federal government does and the strength of the balance sheet. If we want to build out of the housing crisis that we have in America, if they backstopped or provided cheap funding, um, it would make a huge difference. It's, it's funny because in the U.S., we subsidize stabilized asset financing through Fannie and Freddie. In Canada, they subsidize construction financing. <laughs> so it's uh, you know, different, different approaches, different countries. Uh, yeah. But I like that. Good answer. Um, this next one. If you could bet on one city or place other than your own, what would it be and why? I, um, I'll give two slightly different answers. I, so I, I would only want to talk about places I know pretty well, which means I live there. I think that London and Zurich, uh, for different reasons, are just spectacular cities that have shown a lot of resilience in different places. Uh, different times. I think Zurich has an unprecedented quality of life um, and the way that public transportation works there. Um, you have to live it to experience it, but it's a magical experience um, where it's, it's seamless and you don't think about it and it just works in a way that I've never seen anywhere else. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a tremendous achievement in terms of, in particular, the political structure that supports it. They have a very diversified um, government and yet it works and then london i think is just um a very unique city that uh, always has something to offer and uh and has very centrist government that has managed to avoid all of the pitfalls on the left and on the right in terms of the extremes amazing so jan Schramek, thank you so so much for coming on our show today uh you are working on probably in my view the most ambitious real estate project underway at least in the united states today uh and it's going to be fascinating to watch you execute this over the next decade, two decades, and more. 
Um, so I hope to have you back on at some point. Uh, check in how it's going, maybe mid construction. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, and I encourage everyone to check out uh, California Forever. The plans are on the site. Um, very, very great read. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. It was great to talk, Brad. And uh, let's do it again once we've broken ground. Looking forward to it. Listeners, thanks so much for joining in to today's conversation with Jan Schrammack, the CEO of California Forever. If you enjoyed this discussion, I really encourage you to subscribe to Thesis Driven on Substack, where we share all of the conversations and insights that we have. Please join us next week for a conversation with Jillian Hellman, the CEO of Realty Mogul, where we're going to talk about the future of the crowdfunding space and what that means for real estate. Should be a fun conversation hitting on a lot of topics very close to the core of what we cover here. Thanks and see you next week.